Welcome back. Chapter 15 begins the third part of the 1605 novel. It opens with another interruption, somewhat similar though not as drastic, to the one we saw at the beginning of chapter 9 when the narrator lost the original manuscript. This time, the narrator informs us that according to Cide Amete, the original Arabic author, Don Quixote and Sancho entered the same forest into which they had watched the shepherdess Marcella disappear. They look everywhere but cannot find her, so they stop at a meadow full of fresh grass beside which ran a pleasant and cool stream. This is another literary topic, a locus amenus, or pleasant place, where master and servant eat and rest. Thus we are still within the scope of the pastoral genre when the narrator reminds us of both the sexual theme and the southern trajectory of the preceding chapters. It does not occur to Sancho to tie Rocinante, for he knew him to be so meek and so little prone to lust that all the mares of the pasture of Cordoba would not tempt him to wander. As we saw in chapter 5, the devil, a frequent intruder in the novel, arranges that some Galician drovers choose the same spot to allow their herd of mares to graze. By the way, notice that the people of Yanguas, referred to in the chapter heading, have absolutely nothing to do with the episode. Cervantes' description of Rocinante's reaction is noteworthy, both for its euphemistic approach to the horse's sexuality and for its indirect imitation of Don Quixote's chivalric voice. He felt the urge to frolic with the maiden mares, and abandoning, as soon as he caught scent of them, his natural manner and custom, and without taking leave of his owner, he broke into a brisk little trot, and he went off to communicate his need to them. The mare's reaction reminds us of Marcela, but they, who, so it seemed, were more interested in grazing than in anything else, received him with horseshoes and teeth. Then the drovers also beat him, leaving him on the ground in a bad way. Por Rocinante. Here he reminds us of the pathetic fate of his master at the end of so many episodes. Don Quixote insists on revenge. And although Sancho notes that they are more than 20 and we're no more than two and more like one and a half, Don Quixote responds, I am worth a hundred. As usual, our heroes are crushed and thrown to the ground where they contemplate their situation. First, with a meek and mournful voice, Sancho asks Don Quixote for two swigs of that drink of filthy blas, and Don Quixote swears that he will have it within two days. Then Don Quixote tries to explain what just happened, attributing the disaster to his own violation of the laws of chivalry for raising my sword against men who were not armed knights. For this, the god of battles has punished him, and in the future, it is the squire who must punish such scoundrels. Sancho, as always, replies that he is a peaceful man, and that in no way will he take up his sword, neither against villain nor knight. This response worries Don Quixote, and his speech is suggestive, first of the major military disaster of late 16th century Spain, the Armada, and second of political authoritarianism. According to the Mad Knight, Sancho must fight to obtain his proper social status. If the winds of fortune turn in our favor, filling the sails of our desires such that we land on one of the islands that I have promised you, what good would it do you if when I conquer it, I were to make you its lord, for you will make that impossible by not being a knight. Political fortunes are unpredictable and one must have wisdom in order to assert control. Whereas Don Quixote interprets this great storm of blows they have just suffered as an inevitable aspect of the life of knights errant, Sancho remains skeptical. So Don Quixote must shore up his argument, although we have to admit that the examples he gives are not exactly convincing. Among the knights who were milled during their adventures, Don Quixote mentions the hilarious case of the knight of Phoebus, who trapped by his enemies, found himself in a pit, deep underground, bound hand and foot, and there they gave him one of those things known as enemas, made of melted snow and sand, which almost finished him off. It is not surprising that Sancho remains doubtful. At the end of chapter 15, we notice a turn toward the asinine theme similar to that of chapter 5. Sancho's ass is the only survivor of the recent pounding, and so Don Quixote observes that this little beast will now substitute for Rocinante, carrying me away from here to some castle where my lesions will be healed. 
Don Quixote cites the mythological example of that good old Silenus, a tutor and teacher of the joyful god of laughter, who, when he entered the city of a hundred gates, was most pleased to ride atop a beautiful ass. This is a curious confusion between the Thebes of Greece and the Thebes of Egypt. The chapter ends in a way reminiscent of the flight of Mary and Joseph. Sancho lifted Don Quixote onto his ass and tied a rope to Rocinante, and leading the donkey by the halter, he headed more or less toward where he thought he would find the king's highway, where he discovered an inn. As expected, our heroes are soon debating whether the building is an inn or a castle.